Okay, it's a pleasure to have you here. And welcome to today's talk on conceptualizing and measuring adaptation towards a basic agreement on what adaptation is and how to measure it. And I should say, just by way of starting, that really measuring adaptation perhaps is not a problem we will solve today. Um, adaptation, as most people know, is how to adjust to climate change. Mitigation, the other part of climate change uh, policy, is to actually reduce uh, greenhouse gas emissions. Adaptation, which has become more prominent in consideration by policymakers over the last decade or so, is where discussion is given and consideration to how to actually accept the fact that climate change is happening and try to minimize the damage. It refers to policies to reduce the biophysical, social, and economic vulnerability um, across sectors and across individuals. We are very lucky today to have three experts with us from across the globe, and they are with us from uh, Sweden and Kenya today. We have Lisa Delmuth, who's uh, a Associate Professor in the Department of International Relations at the University of Stockholm. She will be speaking uh, initially regarding issues uh, of the global need for adaptation and how uh, international organizations are receiving the challenge of addressing adaptation. After uh, Professor Delmuth, we will have Janet Nongbalu, uh, who is the Regional Programs Coordinator for the Eastern Africa Grain Council. Uh, Ms. Nombalu uh, will address challenges faced by the private sector in the agricultural sphere in relation to accepting adaptation and actually working with some of the issues relating to adaptation uh, faced uh, in her industry, in, which is agriculture in uh, Eastern Africa. Then, uh, Maria Therese Gustafsson, an assistant professor in political science at Stockholm University, will present also on issues of global climate policies um, in adaptation, but across a range of sectors. So without further uh, discussion, at the outset, I would like to have people save questions and post them in the Q&A area on Zoom towards the end, and to thank our speakers very much for participating at what is a late hour in other time zones, and um, to introduce uh, Lisa to please um, start her talk. Thank you. Thank you so much, Todd, for this great introduction, and uh, thanks very much for having me. It's really a pleasure to talk about adaptation from the perspective of the research we're doing at Stockholm University. Um, so, as you alluded to in the beginning, for, well, about 50 years or so, we have known about global warming, and it has been clear that the damage is here and that we have to adapt to climate change. Um, but we are still mainly debating and uh, funding the reduction of CO2 emissions, that is mitigation. Um, future changes in the climate are expected to lead to changes in the frequency, intensity, and duration of extreme weather events, um, heat waves, heavy rain, droughts, associated wildfires, like uh, right now at the moment happening in the US, um, coastal flooding happening in many <clears throat> parts of the world. And both the developed and developing world are affected by climate risks uh, for, well, human security in our civilization, but the burden is not shared equally. Um, so basically, um, since the 1970s, over 95% of deaths from climate and weather related disasters have occurred in uh, the developing countries. Uh, so particularly for developing countries, adaptation is a main concern. And climate related disasters, as has been shown by um, environmental social science research, can cause population displacement, social unrest and conflict and other problems. Um, and uh, what I would like to talk about in my pitch is basically um, about the politics and the global framing of climate change adaptation that has for a very long time been talked about a highly technological and localized issue. 
so very briefly, because Todd already introduced the concept, what do we really mean by adaptation? Well, it's used in um, very many different ways, but the IPCC defines adaptation as any adjustment in social, ecological, and economic systems in response to observed and expected climate change. Um, any reactions to alleviate impacts or take advantage of new opportunities. So basically the notion of adaptation includes preventive tasks such as disaster risk reduction or also mitigation in my view. Um, and we know that adaptation is necessary because we failed in reducing carbon emissions. Um, so it is a story of defeat, but I don't think it's, we should only see it as a negative story of defeat, but it's also a story of forward-looking constructive dialogue. Um, it's a collective endeavor to achieve um, fair and legitimate and effective adaptation. My main points today are that adaptation is increasingly being debated as a political issue, that it is a borderless challenge, and that this begs questions about how to achieve legitimate and effective climate change adaptation. So climate change adaptation is an ambiguous concept and um, it has historically been viewed as a localized matter, for example, pertaining to river decontamination, embankment construction, uh, selection of um, climate insensitive um, agricultural seeds, and so on. But today it's increasingly subject to debate and it's interpreted differently in different policy communities and in different parts of the world. It is transsectoral and multi-issue, as Marie Therese later on will talk about. Um, to give you some evidence of how adaptation is talked about at the global level nowadays, so this is Twitter data um, illustrating the 20 most frequent words and tweets mentioning climate change adaptation by the UN agencies that you see here, by UN OCHA, the United Nations Development Program, Food and Agriculture Organization, World Health Organization, UNICEF, and United Nations Environment. Um, and you can see that, for example, that there are different narratives about it. So for example, in um, relation to UNICEF, adaptation is talked about in relation to zero hunger, youth takeover, um, sensitization, mitigation, agriculture. Adaptation is political in essence. It's about power relations, it's about inequalities, policy preferences, resource allocation and administrative tensions. Second, adaptation is clearly a borderless issue. So issues, examples of issues of transboundary scale related to adaptation are global warming, of course, um, climate related disasters, river flood management, uh, and all of these challenges make uh, global um, and regional governance necessary. So in the Paris Agreement, adaptation was for the very first time recognized as a global challenge in Article 7. Um, and already before the Paris Agreement around 2007, uh, a series of IPCC reports raised awareness and um, Adaptation is nowadays talked about in different uh, policy areas and different sectors, uh, such as agriculture, disaster risk reduction, development, food, health, migration, and security. So it's dealt with by many different international organizations, not only the climate organizations, which basically um, leads me to talk a little bit about these international organizations that are increasingly addressing adaptation. Uh, there are about 200 international organizations um, uh, that exist. By international organizations, I mean multilateral organizations, intergovernmental organizations. And um, of these, we have uh, studied uh, 40, 50, uh, and they all talk about adaptation and address adaptation in some ways. And these organizations matter greatly because they operate at different levels and they diffuse ideas and information, they fund projects, provide technical assistance, development aid, disaster aid, etc. And they have acquired more power over the past 30 years. Um, so, and they are adequate venues for adaptation governance, in my view, because they are set up as impartial and neutral organizations that pursue the, the, the 
the, the public good, the common good. Uh, now they're not flawless, of course, and we, we can debate um, what their shortcomings are, but they are still uh, the only venues that are supposed to be neutral and impartial. All other organizations that deal with adaptation uh, in global governance, they represent specialized or particular interests, such as multinational corporations, or civil society organizations, or foundations. And um, the, the increasing power of these international organizations lead to the question of have they enough capacity to deal with adaptation challenges? Adaptation challenges need nuanced and context sensitive solutions because many adaptation problems have, are, are of local scale. Um, for example, agricultural issues or building dams. And IOs, international organizations, they might not be equipped for uh, identifying local problems and they might uh, highly depend, depend on uh, non-state actors uh, delivering um, information from the ground. So the quick answer to the question of, well, have they enough capacity is, well, they have limited capacity. They have certainly some capacity and some power, but their capacity is limited because they have broad mandates, but operate at multiple levels. They depend highly on external funding, both from state and non-state actors. And non-core funding, that is the earmarked um, part of international organizations budgets um, is declining and has declined um, uh, for a few years now. Uh, while the core funding that is uh, frequently contributed by the member states remains relatively stable. But of course that varies from organization to organization. To give you a concrete example, um, the example that is basically most often cited when it, when it comes to capacity shortcomings of international organizations, that is the World Health Organization. And Maria Therese will talk later about um, uh, the really exciting and important work that the WHO is doing in the area of climate health. Um, and considering its really broad mandate, the WHO has a relatively small budget. So previous research has estimated um, that the WHO's budget for 2018 to 2019 was just under 4.5 billion US dollars, which you can compare to the total health and social services budget of Quebec, which is 33 billion US dollars. So it's just a fraction of it, but it's an organization that is supposed to deliver policies of global reach. And what is more, the WHO has about 80% non-core funding. Um, and the non-core funding is threatened to be reduced even more now that it is under attack uh, from, um, from populists around the, around the globe. And in general, adaptation funding is scarce. Uh, so Todd, for example, um, has uh, revealed in his research that about 4% uh, of an estimated 500 billion US dollar in total climate financing in 2007 was destined for adaptation. Only 4%. So resources are scarce. So um, I would like to talk about two aspects that um, international organizations really need, two resources that they really need. Uh, in order to deal with this limited capacity. And uh, one is legitimacy, uh, that is basically the support of citizens and elites. And the second is um, uh, information from private actors to be able to act effectively. So I'll start with legitimacy. Um, let's, so in our research, we uh, define legitimacy as trust, so the, the, the extent to which uh, citizens or elites, so basically individual people, trust international organizations to use their authority appropriately. And the basic argument is that if people trust international organizations or any other political institution, they are more likely to act in line with these institutions, norms and rules and trusted organizations will be able to raise more funding. So that's very relevant for IOs, for international organizations. And the big question is, um, and it's also widely debated in the media at the moment, is do we see a general backlash against the liberal world order in terms of declining trust among citizens' elites? And the short answer is, 
that the data does not support such a conclusion. Um, so we do not see a secular decline in trust in international organizations, but we see a lot of country specific variation and certainly in some countries trust is very low. So to give you some data for that, this is data from the World Value Survey, uh, um, which uh, uh, is a public opinion poll of global reach based on um, samples of between 60 and 70 countries. So if you look at the bold line, uh, you see how the UN average in the percentage of those having a great deal or quite a lot of confidence in the UN has developed since 1994 until 2019. And you can see that over these five survey waves that um, confidence in the United Nations has declined by about 10 percentage points. Um, but that in recent years, we've seen that there has not been a decline, but rather a slight recovery of the curve. So we can say that, uh, yes, there has been a weakening of uh, public confidence or trust in the UN, but um, recently we've seen a, a recovery pattern. Here you see um, public trust in the African Union. Um, and uh, this is the percentage of people uh, thinking that the African Union uh, helps the country somewhat or helps a lot. And again, the bold line depicts the average um, uh, trajectory for trust in the African Union. And this is, this is uh, data from the Afrobarometer. So you can see that over that's uh, since uh, two, 2002 that it, there has been fluctuations but a relatively stable pattern so no decline here either and just uh, a third and final example on uh, citizen public confidence uh, in international organizations this is an example from the european union from the eurobarometer here you see the percentage of those that tend to trust the eu and again the bold line the average shows a lot of fluctuations a kind of a dramatic decline since the global financial crisis um, 2007 until 2013 and a recovery pattern ever since. I also want to show you briefly some figures about public confidence in international organizations among elites because the the support among elites is especially important for the international organizations because they need to secure funding. So it matters greatly if the, the, the policymakers and the civil society elites and governments and civil servants um, support these organizations. Uh, so what we have done in a research group in Stockholm is to um, survey elites in six different countries and a global sample uh, in, and, and ask about their confidence in different international organizations. And the countries, as I will show you in a minute, are Brazil, Germany, Philippines, Russia, South Africa, and the US, and the set a global sample. Uh, so here too, you can see that the percentage of elites um, coming from various different sectors, having a great deal of quite a lot of confidence in these organizations is not so low as we might think. So um, there is moderate support among these elites, but the figures also show that elites are divided. This is data uh, from the same elite confidence data set. Uh, which shows you confidence in different countries and the global sample. And again, here, I just want to illustrate how um, we do not see a general legitimacy crisis of international organizations in the data, but rather we see a lot of important country specific variation. Okay, my final point is that in order to be effective, international organizations also depend on private actors. They, um, and by private actors, I mean profit and not non-profit actors, such as philanthropic foundations like the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, uh, multinational corporations, civil society organizations, um, employers and employees associations, and so on. And um, over the past 30 years or so, we have seen a trend of uh, international organizations opening up to private actors and international organizations depend greatly on the information provided by these actors that represent particular interests. 
So for example, in the World Bank since the 1970s, uh, it has included NGOs and bank funded projects, uh, but especially since the 90s, um, where NGO projects are also funded by bank financed social funds, so training, their training and networking programs for NGOs and so on. Uh, and again, um, this begs question about how to achieve legitimate and effective global governance. So in summary, just to reiterate my main points, adaptation is a politicized issue, it's a borderless issue, and current developments imply that we need to know more about how global adaptation governance works and when it is legitimate and effective. Thank you very much. Thank you, Lisa, for those comments. And I guess the, uh, the issue of legitimacy um, is an important one and uh, one which is also to be raised in a different guise at the December 2nd talk we are sponsoring on populism. Certainly a lot of nations use uh, populism as a way to in part discredit legitimacy on issues of climate change more generally and also adaptation. So with, on that date, we will be discussing uh, efforts to delegitimize climate change in the United States, uh, in Brazil, and also policy changes in Australia. So that will address the, the national uh, issues. And, and we thank you for presenting the international uh, sort of scope of the problem. We're going to turn Janet to Janet uh, to offer a view of the regional uh, problem and how some private sector uh, industries, in this case agriculture, in several uh, East African countries have dealt with adaptation, have accepted and integrated adaptation into part of their, uh, part of, part of their uh, production chain. So thank you, Janet, and um, we look forward to hearing your presentation. All right, thank you very much, Todd, and thank you, Lisa, for starting us off. Uh, thank you everyone for having me from, uh, from Kenya. Uh, so I'll present specifically on the case study of the Eastern Africa Grain Council. I'll just do a quick introduction, uh, discuss on what matters, effects of climate change on the grain sector, how we are adopting as a private sector and some, recommend, some recommendations for adoption. So just a short brief, uh, the Eastern Africa Grain Council is a membership organization of the grain stakeholders. Uh, they include the traders, the producers, the farmers. Our main mandate is to support the structured trade of grain across countries to ensure food security. I'll share uh, the link to the East Africa Grain Council later in the chat. So the context uh, for the grain sector, we start at the farm level where the production happens. We uh, then the, 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 the process of production uh, all the way from post harvest and how the storage is done and processing of the grain. So what uh, has happened in the grain sector over the years is that um, uh, and noting that grain forms most of the staple of food for most of the people in Eastern Africa region, uh, which includes maize, the beans, sorghum, palm millet, uh, teff, and the African rice. And we are saying an estimated 2 million people in Sub-Saharan Africa depend on maize as a source of food security. Therefore, why we are focusing on maize is because uh, two ways. First of all, it's most uh, impacted with, by climate change yet it's the food, the main food for most of the people in Eastern Africa. So grain, uh, we are also saying dominates most of the diet and uh, most of the smallholders as well uh, grow grain for their consumption and production and also for income uh, generation. So the effect of climate change, uh, as you can see, uh, what is happening is that there's a decline in, glo uh, in global warming, in production due to global warming. 
Uh, in sub-Saharan Africa, the production has declined almost by 20%, which is uh, for us a very big deal because uh, it's the main food uh, for most of the citizens. Uh, land degradation has also been affected uh, by almost 50% in most of the countries, uh, looking at Tanzania, Malawi, uh, Kenya, uh, among other countries. We have high incidences of disease and pests and uh, parasitic plants as well. And nearly 30% of the harvested crop goes to waste also because by the time you harvest um, uh, currently, uh, it's already raining and therefore issues of post-harvest uh, production, uh, post-harvest issues uh, become quite critical. So for some of the grains grown uh, in Kenya, we have soya, we have cowpea, wheat, millet, and maize, which is mostly grown. And most of it is grown in less than two acres of land, uh, which form the smallholder farmers. In Uganda, where we also work, because we work in 10 countries within the Eastern Africa region, we have uh, rice, soya, uh, groundnuts, peanuts, uh, millet, and maize as well. But what is, we are seeing is that the, these crops have been declining over time uh, due to climate change as well. Some of the effects uh, for Kenya is that there is now low yield of the crop, uh, frequent droughts uh, because of uh, climate change, increase in crop pest and disease, emergence of new pests, uh, including armyworms, uh, long dry spells, heavy rains with flooding, and unpredictable weather patterns. In Uganda, where we are also doing uh, some of the work in adaptation, we have irregular rain distribution, droughts, flooding as well, stormy rains with hailstorms, delayed rains, reduced rains amounts, heavy destructive rains, uh, long dry spells, and also aflatoxin prevalence in the, in the region. So some of the examples of post-harvest losses that we are experiencing is what I have on screen, where most of the maize and after production uh, is not um, um, available for consumption, which again is interfering with uh, food production. So what are some of the things that we are doing as private sector uh, to adapt uh, to climate change? Uh, as a sector, we are, we are now making new investments in the sector that we will not have done uh, before because of, the, because of the new structure in the industry. What this means is that we are, the investor, investments in the green sector, uh, who include the producers, the traders, and the processors, who, wanted, who seek to maximize their returns, but now they face risks of businesses such as policy impediments and climate change. So the th there's a threat also to the requirements by the private sector on the quantity and the quality of the produce, especially for those who are processing, are uh, not able to access raw material that is um, of good quality, and also for the consumers to get good quality grain because of these effects. So climate change is also making the industry to become more organized. Uh, that's, a, that's, a, that's, a, that's on a good level because we have to also adapt and see how best we can uh, have a profitable grain trade in the region. So some of the practices, uh, are, uh, the practices that are changing at post-harvest levels, we are seeing uh, because most of the producers at, at small scale farmers, uh, use of shellers to quicken harvesting, which um, are being modified over time use of integrated pest management practices. We also now are investing in hematic bags, especially at farm level, where we can store the grain uh, because once, sometimes there's too much flooding, sometimes there's too much moisture at, uh, at the farms. So we are looking at some of the investments uh, such as hematic bags. Uh, certification of warehouses is also uh, increasing. Uh, use of gunny bags and trampoline. Uh, and also at crop management level, we are seeing um, adopting drought tolerant crops, uh, some of the abandoned crops, uh, use of irrigation and terracing and uh, zero tillage, which uh, was not there uh, before.
before. So what are also some of the cl climate proof adaptation uh, areas that the private sector is doing? Uh, there is now increased research and development on adaptive input varieties, and this is uh, becoming widespread as uh, the stakeholders try to see how best to uh, to adapt to climate variabilities. Then there's investment in mach machinery and equipment for smart agriculture. Uh, this again has been a new investment in the sector. Uh, getting proper storage facilities for green safety. Uh, noting that uh, because at farm level where most of the grain has, ha, is produced, there is uh, usually limited storage facilities. So we are seeing more of those, um, the a demand for better proper storage facilities, uh, management of new pests and diseases. Uh, as private sector, we are also getting post-harvest uh, equipment such as dryers, uh, and also trying to see how to manage aflatoxin and other mycotoxins that affect the grain. Uh, we are also looking at a probable uh, financing models such as the warehouse receipting as an instrument so that farmers can be able to store their grain longer and are able to sell it at a time when, may, uh, when the prices are favorable to them. Because during harvest, when uh, the harvest and the, um, the, the, weather, the weather patterns are not uh, favorable to them, uh, instead of getting the, the losses, we are advising them to support, uh, to store their grain longer and be able to get uh, finances. So a warehouse receipt system is uh, one of the investments. Then we've also invested in an online trading platform, which is called the GSO Core System. Uh, which is again uh, a model for supporting structured trade and also market information systems that can support the, uh, the private sector. Uh, so some of the barriers for private sector adaptation is that uh, sometimes we are not able to access timely information and uh, on when it's likely to maybe to, to rain or when the, the dry spells will be there. So an information gap uh, is one of the barriers as private sector. So also another one is land ownership and land tenure to make uh, lasting changes to the farm. Some of the climate uh, smart practices require you to make changes also on farming practices. And because uh, land tenure is a big issue around here, so one of the issues we want to address as private sector is also that. Then access to equipment and machinery to invest. Uh, as I said earlier, 80% um, uh, of the people growing these uh, grains are the smallholder farmers. So they don't have access to the machinery and investments for conservation agriculture. So that's one of the other barrier uh, for the adaptation. Then access to finance to invest in climate change option. Uh, I think this, as we talk about adaptation, and I, and I think Lisa said, uh, some of the organizations that uh, may be supporting uh, adaptation may look at it at a very high level. But for the, for the private sector, for the farmers, they just want basic equipment or basic uh, um, equipment that can support at farm level or at their factory level uh, to, in the adoption process. Then we also have a limited awareness on what to do uh, because as we experience these challenges uh, every year, uh, new challenges, especially pest and disease, uh, new challenges of aflatoxin and mycotoxin, new challenges. So the technical capacity for some of the private sector to adopt is also a, a challenge. Then to quantify the investments put in mitigation adaptation by the, uh, the private sector, for a long time this has not been quantified on the cost benefits analysis of climate resilience for the green sector. Uh, what uh, the private sector or the farmers or the traders or the processors are having to uh, invest further in their pockets so that they can uh, adapt or uh, have resilience around climate change 
has not been fully uh, quantified. And this is some of the things that we are requesting as private sector so that we can uh, mobilize more resources uh, from the private sector themselves as well. So what are some of the asks for the private sector and uh, to support us in, in adaptation? Uh, we are participating in more uh, dialogues and discussions so that we can increase the voice in the international sphere for the private sector, whether at smallholder level, whether at uh, small agribusiness uh, businesses, that that voice is raised and at international uh, spheres and solutions are found that can support uh, all the stakeholders. We are also requesting for enhanced dialogues with governments at all levels to create an opportunity to contribute to international policy and development and adaptation. And I thank Todd for this opportunity because this is one of such a forum where we can uh, have an international discourse on uh, some of the adaptation options. Then we are requesting to set standards uh, setting process for food and agriculture and national planning frameworks that can provide food safety nets uh, for most of the maybe African um, uh, citizens, especially because they uh, rely on grain for their food, um, for their food, staple food, yet that process is already threatened by the effects of climate change. Then we're asking for improved alignment of national requirements with international standards, uh, especially some of the standards on the food items. Uh, some of the, also a way to enhance ease of doing business around the green sector uh, so that we can be able to have uh, profitable businesses that also support uh, the citizens in food security. Then participation in the process to establish codes of conduct for responsible business practices and adaptation. Uh, so we request to be involved in that. Then create an environment that is more conducive and responsive and to productive investments, especially for the private sector. Then creating of a level playing field that's up to enable fair competition and uh, more business environment. So for now, I would uh, request to stop there. Uh, we can have a discussion as we move forward. Thank you very much. Many thanks, Janet. Uh, your... Thank you. Uh, Janet, your, your data was very stark about the effects of climate on, uh, on production of grain. And thank you for presenting that to us and look forward to further discussion of sort of what is to be done, how, how to proceed, how, how can the world address this global, national, and subnational problem. Um, our last speaker, uh, Maria Teres, is going to address this at a sector by sector kind of analysis. And uh, so, we thank her for participating as well and turn over the Zoom room to her. Thank you very much, Todd. Uh, it's really uh, a pleasure to be here and be able to share the work that we have been carried out at Stockholm University. Uh, as Lisa emphasized, climate adaptation is no longer seen as a purely technical and local policy challenge. In the recent years, climate adaptations has entered on the center stage of the international climate negotiations within UNFCCC. And at the same time, the impacts of climate change are starting to be felt across societal sectors, leading to a wide range of actors that have started to develop adaptation responses. So today I will present the work that I have carried out together with the Global CLIM group at Stockholm University, in which Lisa is also part of. And in the last couple of years, uh, we have carried out work about how international organizations in different issue areas, such as health, food, migration, and disaster risk management have started to address adaptation. 
Our findings are based on uh, complementary sources such as document analysis, survey data and semi structured interviews with officials working with climate adaptations in different international organizations. So, sorry. Um, So, sorry about that. So, here we can see the sum of governance responses of 14 international organizations between 97 and 2017. Uh, this table is based on a data set that Eche Corral, which is one of our PhD students, have created. And we have coded different types of responses to adaptation, such as declarations and statements, publication of reports, funds or fund creation, projects and programs, and institution building. So we can see here that there was a dramatic increase in governance responses to adaptation among international organizations in 2007. And this is hardly surprising given that this was the year when the fourth, fourth IPCC report was released and the Bali Action Plan was adopted. And during this time, the executive heads of several IOs such as UNHCR, UNDP, WHO spoke out about the importance of addressing adaptations within their respective policy domains. So we can see here that there is an increase in the governance responses of all organizations after 2007. During the period 97 to 2007, the average governance responses amounted to almost 10 per IO, whereas this number had increased to 72 on average per IO during the period 2008 until 2017. For example, the UN Office for Disaster Risk Reduction responded most often to have adaptation issues among the compared organizations, whereas Organizations such as the United Nations Security Council or the United Nations Population Funds are among the ones that have responded the least. You can also see that development banks such as the World Bank have in recent years increasingly and forcefully advocated for adaptation and the mainstream streaming of adaptation in development policies and programming. Similarly, the Food and Agriculture Organization have stepped up its work on adaptation and are in the process of mainstreaming adaptation into its various activities. Within humanitarian assistance, like at UNOCHA, it has been more challenging to integrate adaptation that as these kind of activities with adaptation require longer time frames. So with regards to UNOCHA, for example, there is a strong preference among key actors to focus on a core mandate to save lives. So here you can see um, this figure shows different types of governance responses that the international organizations have developed. So we can see um, if we compare the period between 97 to 2007 with the later period 2008 until 2017, um, we can see the increase in responses to, to the second period, period was mainly due to an increase in rhetorical actions. Indeed, the proportion of rhetorical actions, which we define as declaration, statements and reports to all type of responses rose from 27 to 26 to 38 percent, while there was a relative decline in number of responses involving own funding from 11 to 7% of all responses and institution building that declined from 13 to 6%, whereas projects and or programs uh, remain about the same. So yet while the average amounts of funding provided by these organizations for adaptation have decreased, the rhetoric on the need to address adaptation problems have, has intensified. And this result is interesting, we think, because we have looked at the 
uh, UN agencies, major regional organizations, which together control the bulk of financial resources available for multilateral cooperation. So, um, to identify the factors that could help us to explain uh, IO adaptation responses, we have also carried out a number of in-depth case studies. So more specifically, we looked at WHO in the area of climate risks, climate health risks, and UN environments in the area of climate security risks that they have addressed in recent years. And finally, UNHCR in the area of climate-related displacements. So um, WHO has been working with climate health related risks since the early 90s. Uh, and they have produced a large number of technical reports on the topic. In 2008, uh, climate health risks were actually incorporated in, in the organization's official mandate. But WHO's aspiration to assume leadership in this area has however been hampered by insufficient funding. The climate migration linkage is contested within UNHCR as it's perceived to be outside its core mandate responsibilities to provide for protection and humanitarian assistance to refugees. Around 2008, the High Commissioner at that time, Antonio Guterres, made attempts to include it in the organization's mandate. There was, however, a strong resistance among the member states to this. Uh, but there has been, and the, despite this strong resistance, a uh, relatively small number of um, IO officials within the organizations have been quite influential to bringing some sort of global visibility to the issue. But at the same time, the topic has not been become widely accepted and prioritized within the organization as a whole. So finally, we looked at UN Environment's work um, on the integration of climate adaptation um, and security or conflict issues. They worked, started to work on this topic around 2011 and carried out a study um, that was a sort of preparatory study to start to identify the fruitful entry points to address the topic. Um, within UN environment, the climate security linkage has remained contested and prioritized. Um, but the organization has continued to collaborate with different NGO groups that were pushing for climate security. And finally, in 2015, the opportunity to lead a relatively large climate and security program funded by the European Commission arose. However, due to the shortfalls in technical expertise on the climate conflict linkage, the agency has remained heavily dependent on NGOs to implement the program. So based on the analysis of these three organizations, we identified three explanatory factors that could help us to better understand um, the different types of varying degrees of responses. So first, with regards to perceived com problem complexity, is an important constraint that undermines the ability to respond to adaptation problems. Climate impacts on, on conflict or displacement is perceived as highly complex when, and when prom problems are complex, there is often a high degree of scientific uncertainty and officials within international organizations might find it difficult to analyze and address a policy issue. And this was clearly the case in UNHCR and UN environment, uh, where perceived problem complexity made it difficult to evaluate the likely effect of different responses, which made the IO staff unwilling to engage with the topic. And this is in sharp contrast to the WHO officials who emphasized that there were plenty of evidence about how to address the climate related health risks. For them, it was rather a question of the effectiveness of different responses rather than uncertainty of the linkage between climate risks and, and health as such. So second, as Lisa also talked about, um, that some scholars have highlighted how the existence of adaptation funding in, in combination with the ambiguity of the concept has opened up for new possibilities of international organizations in different issue areas that has traditionally not been related to climate, such as health, food, and migration, to engage with in adaptation governance. However, 
climate adaptation funding is still heavily underfunded and the majority of the ad adaptation funding still is dedicated to sort of more traditional adaptation projects related to agriculture, water manage and so on. And this makes it, of course, harder for internet organizations that want to work with sort of newer issue linkages to, to engage with adaptation. And as Lisa also mentioned, the funding for international organizations are increasingly earmarked for specific purposes, uh, which leave, leave them uh, with less room to expand in new issue areas. So we can see that some of the organizations that have advanced most, like UNDP, FAO, the World Food Program as well, they have um, developed, they have been uh, able to get access to external adaptation funding. So, uh, with regards to fragmentation at the global level, in recent decades, there has been a shift from more state-centered to an increasingly fragmented global governance landscape. Fragmentation uh, refers to a situation in which numerous organizations tackle the same problem without really coordinating their actions. And in the context of this fragmented governance landscape, we found that it was crucial whether fragmentation had a conflicted or a cooperative nature. In a situation of cooperative fragmentation, an issue area is addressed, is addressed by different institutions and decision-making procedures that are loosely integrated. And the relationship uh, between the norms and the principle of these institutions is ambiguous. In the case of the health, we found that fragmentation was mainly cooperative. The level of institutional fragmentation at the global and national levels implied that health professionals do not participate at UNFCCC or in national adaptation planning processes and can therefore not ensure that the health components were adequately addressed. WHO officials made substantial efforts and have been relatively successful in facilitating coordination between the health, health and climate communities. And we argue that this is largely due to the cooperative fragmentation. And this is in sharp contrast to the UN environment that sought to link climate and conflict. The weak institutional linkages between climate adaptation and security institutions are underpinned by conflicting ideas and framing of how and in which venue climate and conflict is issues should be addressed. We find that this is much more difficult to integrate adaptation when weak institutional linkages are accompanied by conflicting norms. So finally, domestic sectorial silos. At the domestic level, international organizations also face the problem that environmental policy communities is, op is often separated from other issue areas, which create transactions cost to try to sort of coordinate these policy communities it could be quite high. Like in the case of global governance, fragmentation, powerful actors um, could resist the integration of certain policy communities. Security actors, for instance, rarely coordinate with environmental policy communities. Moreover, there is often a disconnection between the uh, national and the subnational levels. Subnational policy communities that are often more focused on adaptation are often weaker than the national ones that are focused on mitigation. And at the same time, international actors are often more focused on the, on the national level. So, um, just to summarize the sort of broader lessons from the work that we carried out, we have shown that the international organizations are important agents in, in this emerging global adaptation governance landscape. And secondly, adaptation is transsectoral trans in, in, and it's increasingly linked to other issue areas in, at the international level. And finally, the problem complexity, re resource availability and the fragmentation shape um, to what extent IOs in different issue areas are able to develop adaptation responses. So thank you very much. There. Thanks, Maria Teres. Um, we'd like to collect questions and spend at least 20 minutes or for those who can a half hour addressing uh, questions and answers. I am going to just take the, the moderators uh, privilege and just ask the first one, but I'm going to collect some more questions 
two or three more before turning over to the to the panelists to reply. Okay, I think just to sort of boil down the content a bit into a more polemical uh, position, just so that we can enter into the policy debate. Um, and, and because the, this series, which will continue over the coming weeks, is meant as a stock take, particularly of some of the most vulnerable uh, communities in the world, because adaptation is viewed in places like the United States, often with exceptions, like now that it's hurricane season, of course, but largely adaptation is viewed as something that happens far away from here. And frankly, that's diminishingly true, if it ever was. Um, but I think a question for all of the speakers, given that, um, you know, that the University of Stockholm researchers convey that, in fact, there isn't a lot of resources being dedicated to adaptation, and yet, rhetorically, it is high on the agenda of international organizations. Um, and given the idea that the East, uh, Eastern Africa Grain Council has had to face reductions of 30% in, in crop yields as a result directly of climate change, if I understood correctly, and has undertaken all of these measures. Um, the question is, you know, how do, we, how do we drive this home, the need to address adaptation more extensively? And also, I think a question that emerges is, if we get too comfortable with adaptation, if our procedures for adapting actually work very well, will that diminish the incentive to continue mitigating? That is, is, the, is there some sort of zero sum relationship in the resources allocated to climate change? Is our resources on uh, adaptation resources taken from mitigation? It seems sometimes that that's the case. Obviously it shouldn't be, but you know, what is the reality here? Okay, I, I guess I pose that polemic and then slip away to seek more uh, questions from the audience and then we'll come back. So uh, from the audience, in addition to the question I just asked, um, several people have questions for Janet about conservation agriculture and um, whether, it, whether you're using conservation or mostly regenerative agriculture and um, you know, how, how this is transpiring and perhaps how adaptation has changed the use of crop rotation, cover crops, intercropping, et cetera. Another question for her is about, uh, you know, whether it's in the interest of buyers of these crops to assist in adaptation or grain storage. Um, and one more question regarding GMO crops. I, I suppose relating that to adaptation would be to say, has GMO design of more um, resistant seeds been part of the discussion, okay? And another question more generally uh, is about the evidence that national actors are more focused on mitigation and subnational actors perhaps on adaptation. We'll ask one more question and this round and then I'll seek some responses. That question would be how the speakers might compare institutional capacities for climate mitigation to the state of those for climate adaptation. Indeed, that's, I think, a rephrasing of, of a related question that I stated, but it is also more direct saying, is one stronger and better developed than the other? Okay, so I'll turn to all of you, please, to answer those questions, and then I will take another round of questions. Thank you. And also, please put your video on, if that's okay, while you're answering the questions. You want me to start, Todd? I'm sorry, please. Thank you. All right. Okay. Um, thank you very much. I'll start with uh, your first uh, question and discussion on uh, adaptation and uh, versus mitigation. Um, I just wanted to add that one of the reasons the uh, private sector is stepping in to adapt is because the um, situation is a challenge to them. So it's taking uh, funding or resources out of their smaller businesses and forcing them 
to use the limited resources they have to start the adaptation process because at the end of the day it is the where the they're the wearers of the shoe that pinches most so if uh, international organizations or um, uh, and, and others would focus more on investing on adaptation at a high level or supporting adaptation at high level, then it frees some of the resources from the private sector, the limited resources they have to be able to use that to grow maybe their businesses or to support in food security. So there is a request and I ask that be, uh, the international organizations and the um, countries that emit most of the, uh, the gases for uh, global warming should be able to invest more on adaptation and as well as mitigation more so that the, those who have to invest more uh, to adapt at very small scale level can be supported. So that is our request. And uh, we would also request that let's not push the agenda of mitigation far because the, I don't think we will adapt enough, uh, fast enough to be able to again do away with mitigation. So mitigation is highly required at that level and the focus and the discussion should continue at a big level so that you are not forcing the, uh, the smallholder farmers or the small businesses or the private sector who are just trying to eke a living or the citizens who are just trying to get food secure or to get a meal on their table to then have to use that resources, you know, for, you know, mitigation, which again, uh, would not have been the case, um, you know, if the uh, processes were done correctly. So that's one of it. Then from the question and answer for the conservation and regenerative, regenerative agriculture, yes, there is a push for crop rotation, but um, having understood the farming systems across Africa, you almost find that the farmers keep growing the same crop over time. Uh, some of it is culturally, some of it is socially, some of it is because your maize is what you, you eat uh, for porridge in the morning, for your meal in the afternoon, for your other meal in the evening. So there's that continuous need or push to grow the same crop so that you also feel that your family is food secure. So the issue of uh, crop rotation may uh, at some times, yes, we try to push for it, but at the percentage of 80% of smallholder farmers who are growing in less than two acres of land and then consolidate that to feed a nation, uh, I sometimes you, you sympathize with them on the, on the requirements for that. But yes, there are attempts to do that. But of course, yes, it's at a very small scale level. Uh, for those who buy the grain, um, because again, it's a willing buyer, willing seller situation. Uh, most of the buyers of the grain are the ones who process it. Uh, at this particular time, they have an option on where to buy. And uh, most of the, again, the farmers who produce this are also fragmented. So we try to make a, uh, support them to aggregate so that they can market together. And in that way, then there would be an incentive for investment, uh, maybe in grain storage. Uh, so at that level, the, the buyers already have their own storage at uh, their premises, but at farm level, that is limiting because at that particular time, the, the demand for the crop is there and then there's limited engagement uh, with the supplier. So that's why there's a issue of adaptation and grain storage at that level. Uh, and moving forward, some of the governments have uh, made uh, attempts to have uh, national stocks that can then you know, support the buyers to do storage at centralized levels. But again, that is a small scale. Uh, we would like to push for more investments and higher investments at that level to support the, the farmers. Uh, for GMO in most of the East Africa countries, especially for food crops, is still not um, 
favorable. It's still not uh, supported by policy. Uh, there's a lot of debate and research going on, but uh, currently uh, GMO for the food crops, especially for the staple food crops, is not um, is not an, is not yet an option. Uh, we have other GMO uh, sub, uh, processes like BT cotton and all that, but for food crops, the discussion is still uh, is not the approvals are still not there. I think those ones I can take for now. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, would anybody else like to answer that round of questions? Um, sure, I can continue with um, two questions that were uh, that dealt with international organizations and they were very good and very difficult. So the, the first is about whether um, we have greater global capacity in international organizations to deal with mitigation than with adaptation or the other way around. And the other one is about where to look for funding if funding is so scarce. Um, and I think, um, the, so the answer is very difficult because it basically means that we have to compare adaptation to mitigation problems and they are, they're of a very different nature, I think. And this speaks a bit to the topic of the, the seminar, namely how to measure adaptation. So we have much more scientific certainty about mitigation than we have about adaptation. Uh, the problem is more concentrated, while adaptation is much more diffuse and linked to different issue areas. It's multi-sectoral. Um, and um, we have much more mitigation, well, funding uh, and much more public awareness. If you look at social media data, for example, it's very clear that um, mitigation is talked about in relation to the climate crisis, um, a lot linked to um, emotions and to emergency rhetoric while um, adaptation is mostly talked about in relation to mitigation, if at all. And it's much less frequently talked about still. Uh, yeah, and as we said during the talk um, worldwide, about only 4% of the total um, public and uh, private climate funding um, measured in 2017 went to adaptation, which is really very little. Um, and what is more, so at the global level, we have one clear venue to deal with um, mitigation, which is the UNFCCC and to some extent also the IF. Uh, the I IPCC um, and the UNFCCC has, I mean, of course, we know that the global uh, climate change conferences and the most recent one has been postponed, but um, we, we, we know that uh, we're making very slow progress. Um, uh, but we have a couple of powerful instruments at hand, at least, uh, to coordinate domestic actions and to collect information in the NDCs about domestic progress, about uh, climate change mitigation. There's no such instrument, such central venue at the global level for adaptation. So as Maria has presented, it's spread across different international organizations and it really depends on the issue area and another organization, um, what the capacity is. So I think that we're, we're much, I mean, yeah, with these caveats in mind, I think that um, uh, we are better equipped to deal with mitigation than with adaptation, if you can compare these problems at all. And very briefly about where to look for funding. Um, I, I mean, I, I, can, I can only say that um, uh, I think um, a lot of international organizations raise funding from philanthropic um, foundations, like for example, uh, I think uh, as much as um, uh, up to a fifth of the budget of the WHO comes from um, the private sector, uh, and a lot of it of the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. And while it is great that we see greater diversification in the climate finance landscape, I think there are a lot of opportunities. There are also uh, problems uh, related to particular interests, to short term pressure for short term um, measurable. Uh, funding projects, while uh, a lot of work on adaptation, uh, yeah, might need long-term solutions. Um, uh, and um, there are also challenges to uh, global democracy and legitimacy and effectiveness if we more and more depend on particular interests. Although I, I would think that we all want to make the world better, um, we all also answer to different shareholders and stakeholders and um, with that uh, yeah comes this comes a specific character of global adaptation governance 
so yeah, I think where to look for funding, I don't know. Uh, I think a lot, uh, we all look to the private sector and, and putting a lot of hopes in, in how um, they uh, handle adaptation challenges and, and, and help us fund that. Great, thank you. Uh, Maria Therese, would you like to add anything to this round of questions? Uh, I have one more yeah. round of questions. Yeah, I think I would like to um, respond a little bit to the question of comparing the global institutional capacities between mitigation and adaptation as well. I mean, like just add a little bit to what Lisa said, because I think that adaptation is a much newer policy issue and much of the sort of um, information that the data that has coming from IPCC that has focused so much on mitigation. So many organizations that are starting to respond to this are really trying to understand these complex issue linkages. And, but I think there is also like a lot of variance between like in the case of WHO that we looked at there, they have worked with adaptation since the 90s and, and they don't really see this as a, as a highly complex issue, how to respond. So I think that it's a lot of variance and it depends on uh, what particular issue area you're looking at ad adaptation, to what extent you, you have the capacities in terms of resources, knowledge to, to respond in um, by appropriate strategies. Yeah. Great. Okay, thank you. All right, so let me do one more round of questions, but if I may, I would like to just take a moment as, as we can just to thank our speakers and to announce that the next in this series of talks will be November 4th, but at 9 a.m., where we will be featuring uh, some speakers looking at issues of transparency and adaptation spending, particularly in Bangladesh, as a jump off for broader discussions also of issues of transparency and uh, adaptation funding. But that is back to our talk today. I'm sorry to do that little ad, but uh, for a few more questions, if I may uh, take one more round. Um, questions exist on the, on the Q&A regarding funding available for adaptation, uh, which is a very good question that we've addressed also. This specific question is, do we need to turn to the private sector, philanthropic sources? How do we reallocate existing climate finance away from mitigation if we need to and for adaptation? That is one question seemingly for all of the panelists. Another one, please. Um, as a more recent cons consideration uh, than ongoing work on climate mitigation, is the concept of adaptation still under theorized? Or I guess also is it sort of empirically under, under specified? Do we need to do more to understand exactly what we mean by adaptation? And, I, and perhaps that question might go to the, um, the issue of measuring it and understanding it very precisely. And that questioner also asks about culture and different cultures and their responses to adaptation. Are we sensitive to the relative adaptations from country to country and region to region? Another question, please. Um, Climate displacement, which is uh, migration, may not be considered as mitigation and resilience if lands are lost, according to this questioner. If people continue to come for employment for, as climate refugees, I suppose the question would say, um, more industries will be needed. Does anybody have an opinion regarding migration and how to react to displaced peoples um, and especially whether uh, displaced people will be accepted uh, by high carbon emitting countries. I think this relates back to the broader question about differentiated responses to adaptation. That is the countries that emit most of the greenhouse gases, that is the developed countries are not the same ones which are having most of the problems and issues in adaptation. So how do we, how do we reconcile that uh, apparent inequality, and especially with regard to climate migration. I would add to that question, the issue at the United Nations of loss and damage. That is, how is there going to be possible compensation 
especially from the industrialized emitting countries to those which have to build entire new systems for um, uh, you know, embankments to avoid floods from ocean level rise or small island nations, or as is happening in much of Africa, uh, the droughts that is striking and reducing, um, reducing uh, production of crops. Okay, so another question, um, do we need for the UN to support and promote sustainable food systems through regenerative agriculture at a wide scale? Um, and furthermore, regarding international organizations, um, can they implement adaptation pro projects in countries where corruption is a difficult problem? And again, I asked that questioner to consider uh, attending our program on November 4th, our program on November 18th, and also on December 2nd, where we will more explicitly address some of those issues. I think we'll leave it there, but I would like to give uh, an opportunity, please, to all of our speakers to respond, and then we'll wrap up ever so quickly. Um, maybe we'll start in reverse order this time. Maria Therese, would you start? Yeah, thank you very much. So there was a lot of questions, so I would just pick one of those, all of these questions. So there was a question about, are we sufficiently sensible to the uh, different cultures and different country contexts? So I've been, recent, I've been working a lot with um, local communities and indigenous populations in my previous work. And I think that within adaptation governance, there has been a question of like, do we really take on board like indigenous knowledge, indigenous knowledge of um, uh, climate stressors and so on. And there has been a critique about the sort of traditional vulnerability assessments that they are only focusing on the sort of biophysical stressors and not sufficiently looking at the sort of broader context and, and drivers of climate vulnerability. So I think like definitely there are, when we look at all the, the data on, on climate change that is coming from IPCC, I think there is a need of sort of taking on different sorts of knowledge and different sorts of data and, and try to merge it to a to larger extent to make sure that the adaptation strategies that are developed at the local scale are not leading to maladaptation. So yeah, I stop there. Thank you. Uh, okay, uh, that's me now, right? If we were in reverse order, right. Okay, so oh, thanks for great questions. Um, I will also pick one or two. Um, one was about uh, conceptualization and whether adaptation is still insufficiently understood, conceptualized and made measurable. And I think the clear answer is yes. Uh, and I think our seminar is so important to raise awareness about that and to start the discussion, the conversation, and hopefully um, inspire people to do more research on that. Uh, so I, I, I think that uh, I mean, of course, we can revert to the conceptualization of adaptation uh, in the IPCC reports, but I think, so I think that adaptation is linked to different issue areas and the problem is of different nature and different issue areas. And we know way too little about how and to what extent. Um, so that's one thing. Um, and the other thing is that the, the, the qualities of adaptation policy, and by that I mean um, the sensitivity to inequalities, to uh, power asymmetries, the, the fairness, the legitimacy aspect, accountability, transparency, also effectiveness. So all of these qualities of adaptation governance are poorly understood. And um, previous work of um, well-known authors like Neil Adger, for example, have alluded to that problem in, in, in their previous research, but it's not really, uh, we're not, it's not really included in the mainstream definition of adaptation uh, that we work with, so that there are these different qualities to take into account. So we need systematic knowledge about, about those and what they mean in relation to adaptation. And it's a real challenge because ad most adaptation problems, um, I think, uh, if you can quantify that at all, are still at a local scale. Um, but more and more adaptation problems are becoming transboundary or even, even global scale, like global warming. So um, they're highly complex and we need to understand them better across sectors and across different types of qualities of, of adaptation. Um, 
Okay. Thank you, Todd. I, um, I think I can also take one or two. And uh, I would like to discuss on the issue of the measure on return on investment, especially by the fund in community or invest in community. I think that is true that uh, the, the return on investment has not been measured. And like I mentioned earlier also in my presentation for the private sector, adaptation, the issue of the cost benefit analysis on what they are putting in uh, versus what um, they're getting in return has been also a disincentive dis for most of the stakeholders because uh, some of them may ask, what what's, do I get in return? And the measure for that is quite, has not been fully done. Uh, and also to incentivize the smallholder farmers who do not have adequate resources again to be able to use that uh, for adaptation is also a challenge. So maybe the request is uh, if we can do a longer term measure, especially for communities or for sectors in Africa to see how far some of the funds that have already been put in for adaptation or mitigation so far have been used and what is the return so far and what are the gaps. And then we can use the same process also now to bring down to uh, individual investments and quantify all that. And then from that point, we can have a discussion on what has been put in terms of funding. Uh, the other question uh, about uh, climate uh, displacement and forced migration, I could only agree that yes, it could lead to uh, vulnerabilities, especially for land losses and all that. But uh, I think about uh, migration, I think maybe we could ask other countries, especially where there's a lot of uh, migration, forced migration that is happening uh, maybe we could speak into that. The only agreement is that yes, due to climate change, this has happened uh, over time. Uh, the other question or the other comment, especially for the conversation on uh, micro lending and designed specifically for smallholder families <clears throat> uh, so that they can support in investment at community level. I think this is a discussion that should be taken forward where we can support micro lending for, uh, to support the smallholder farmers to collectively work together and have community level mitigation processes. Uh, I think that could be one of the ways uh, among others that we can discuss. I think uh, somebody from Washington University brought that out. I think it's quite uh, solar micro irrigation, rainwater harvesting, uh, mobile training platforms. Uh, all those are very good ideas, I think, which can be supported and invested further. Thank you. Great, thank you very much. Just to, to thank all of you uh, and to express thanks to the audience uh, for your questions and comments and to say that we will continue this series. So please uh, stay posted. The panelists are, are available at their institutional websites. And um, I think all of you are available there, right? We, people can Google and reach you. Um, and um, we look forward to continuing to track other world problems besides COVID, which unfortunately is taking a lot of the attention uh, from a lot of other issues. But as we know, climate change and climate change adaptation continue to be needy of consideration and deep thought. And to that end, I just want to thank our panelists again for uh, starting this discussion of, you know, sort of consideration of different areas of the world and adaptation strategies so very auspiciously. So I, I really appreciate you're joining us today and on behalf of the Center for Environmental Policy at American University, we thank you for, uh, for attending and it seems